Hey guys, welcome to Meditation Amsterdam. My name is Pablo. And in today's video, I want to talk about the most important question that we can ask ourselves. The question that answers all other questions, or at least renders them uh, far less relevant than we thought they were. And um, what the process is behind asking that question. Why is it that's so valuable? So um, we had our meditation workshop last weekend here in Amsterdam and I was preparing a, a lecture for that workshop and I had a, a bit of a challenge coming up with the outline of what to say in 45 minutes all about meditation and um, and the path to self-realization. I mean, how do you encompass so much uh, into uh, that small fragment of time? And also, what do you what do you start with, and what's the angle that you want to take? What's the main analogy, or what's it about? So, what I did is I started by asking people in the audience what. Uh, they thought was the most important question and also I offered some uh, classic examples of things that we believe are these ultimate questions that we typically uh, like to grapple with. So these kind of questions would go along the lines of what is the meaning of life? Um, can I ever find out my real purpose? Uh, how do I experience unconditional love or what is love? Uh, is it possible to know ultimate reality? Uh, is there a God? Right. So these are what we would typically call the big questions in life. And I invited the audience to um, notice that all of those questions have something in common. And they, it is that they are outward oriented towards a subject. Um, the subject might be God, life, love, truth, uh, reality, uh, meaning and purpose, right? So call it what you want. They, they sound like big things, but really they are all objects that we're asking about. And what I invited them to notice was that all those questions are derivatives from a much more fundamental question, which is the one that really counts. And that is the question, who am I? Or what am I? And that question has the very unique and peculiar quality to be the only question you can ever ask in which it is the subject that is the, uh, the target of the question. <clears throat> now, the question, who am I, or the uh, invitation to know thyself, as was written in the uh, entry to the Delphi Oracle, has been uh, the ultimate quest or the ultimate calling. And it is the question that, when figured out, happens to be able to answer all the other quote unquote big questions that I mentioned earlier. It is uh, the ultimate answer in some sense. Now, lest we start to believe that the exploration of that question uh, is a kind of engaging in philosophical musings, you know, is there a God? What is reality? Or let, let's sit in our armchair and discuss philosophically back and forth about logic, about ontology and, and epistemology and the rest of it. Um, the question, who am I, was proposed uh, by uh, Vedanta uh, as a, an instruction rather than a uh, verbal or logical uh, exercise. And the instruction was to, rather than orient our attention outward to objects, <clears throat> much in the way that these uh, earlier questions do. We want to use our focus of attention to try to, try to find its own origin. 
try to figure out what is it what, that we mean when we say I. Normally, we are pointing either towards a ghost behind our eyes or maybe the sense of our body, I am here. Um, but it is an invitation to turn our attention inward, to reverse the flow of awareness or the, reverse the light. And instead of having it go outwards, go into itself and try to use its own capacity to know in order to figure itself out somehow. That is not a philosophical exercise, at least not in the um, um, uh, Aristotelian uh, philosophy, uh, which considered uh, philosophy to be indeed a mental musing. It is more a platonic exercise. We are trying to find our platonic essence within and and to you and to practice philosophy as not so much the love of knowing content but rather the love of the knowing capacity of our mind the love of knowingness in other words so the power of the question who am i <clears throat> resides indeed in the fact that it is different from every other question and it guides us to use our awareness <clears throat> to Engage on an inward investigation that cannot otherwise be done. It cannot be, you can't get there in any other way. And I'll explain a little bit more why. I mentioned it a couple of videos ago. There happens to be several layers to our nervous system. So now I get a little bit technical about it, right? And these layers are, um, you know, there's, there's three layers we could speak of. The innermost layer, the medium layer, and the outer layer. Now, the, the medium and outer layer are very functional, um, very functional layers, right? They, they're fairly physical uh, in nature. Um, and we can apply uh, traditional embodiment techniques to start to tap into that layer. So we can do body scans, we can feel our arms, our legs, we can feel our ground, we can feel our balance, and all these different parts of, uh, of our uh, anatomy. And however, uh, once we've started to colonize the, all that peripheral neurology, the innermost layer has still remained untouched because the innermost layer, and here's something that uh, uh, someone mentioned to me in a conversation a couple of days ago, and I thought, hey, I need to really, really uh, share this. The, the innermost layer of our nervous system can only be felt in first person. In other words, I can be looking at my hand, meaning I, the observer, are here somewhere behind my eyes and I'm looking outward at my hand as an object. But the innermost layer of our nervous system, our central channel, and especially the areas around um, behind the eyes, around the throat, the heart, and the solar plexus, the innermost layers of those, um, that circuitry, those, the, those, uh, that sort of more chakra uh, type circuitry, can only be felt in first person. It cannot see, be seen objectively. It can only be felt as your very own being, yourself, your sense of self. Now, um, time and again, uh, we, we've discussed in this channel the notion that the ego is a fear-based mechanism. And what is interesting about that circuitry, um, the innermost circuitry that can only be felt as I, or can only be felt in first person, is that we could effectively consider the ego as the impulse or the intent to depart away from those centers, especially when we feel um, emotional discomfort. And the re-entry of those centers is a very, very tough and extremely challenging experience because they are centers of your nervous system dedicated to essentially pure sense of self slash survival. So they don't want to be felt, uh, or rather the, the self that you believe yourself to be is the very departure away from these places. That's why feeling like yourself or feeling yourself directly is a very, very challenging endeavor. It takes uh, for many people or perhaps for the average individual many, many months of preparation of your nervous system, learning how to self-regulate, create embodiment, 
clarify the outer layers of the mind, emotions and things, hangups and things of that kind, before you start to feel the pure visceral center of the sense of self, which is something that our, uh, um, that our mind blocked off very early on in life, typically, for the average individual, as I said. Um, <clears throat> there is no way to get there as a witness. In other words, the center of our neurology and the center of our sense of self cannot be felt as a witness, as a detached witness. The, the use of the position of the witness is very handy for every other endeavor that we do in meditation, right? So you can see meditation, I mean, there's been many models of how you progress um, in the different stages, but in the beginning, you are completely enmeshed with the content of your mind and your emotions. You're totally enmeshed with them. As you progress, you detach awareness a bit from, from all that content, and you provisionally occupy what we could call the witness uh, stance. So you feel that you are the witness of the content of your mind and your emotions. However, the witness contains a very fatal flaw. And that is that so long as we feel like there's a, a, an I or a witness in me and the content of the mind and the emotion, that means that there is still one degree of separation between the content of the mind and the, and the sense of self. That degree of separation is the one that the ego doesn't want to let go of because that single degree of separation saying, I am fully accepting what I feel, but there's still an I there, that gives you the uh, leeway or it, or it gives you the, the, the seeming prerogative to say, I am hereby observing in a detached way and maybe fully accepting what I'm feeling. But there's still a me here that could decide otherwise at any point. I could look elsewhere, right? I could go into fantasy land if it gets too squirrely. I could um, uh, start generating thoughts of discomfort or, or, or doubt or, um, you know, self-congratulation at the fact that I'm observing all this stuff or wondering how long it's going to last. So, so that last little leeway it's almost like you want to hold an ace up your sleeve. You want to, uh, you have skin in the game, but not really. You can always pull out at the last minute if you really, really need to. That's, that's ego right there. And that's the witnessing position. Very handy for uh, starting your uh, process of observation and, and detachment from the content. But once you've achieved detachment from the content of your mind, including thoughts and emotions, the next step to do is to go back in and surrender as the very content of your mind um, because otherwise you're still creating that, uh, that room for the ego to create opinions that have nothing to do with actuality and, um, and that's, that's that preservation of the sense of self that can always um, maneuver around the things that it likes and dislikes. So as the witnessing position has been uh, um, uh, solidified or rather um, uh, stabilized, you now have the ability to look uh, at the content of the mind the entire time, but you will feel that with difficult emotions, you'll try to look directly and you, you'll keep bouncing out. You can't get into them because the you that's trying to do this is the very resistance that departed away from those emotions in the first place. <laughs> so it's trying to do a kind of fake U-turn and saying, oh, I can't get there, right? Yeah, well, of course you can't because there's, there's a you that is not, is not your first person. It's, it's, a, it's an imaginary sense of self. So you want to trace that back and ask the question, who am I? You feel your sense of self and you notice that whatever is behind the sense of self is the pure first, the actual first person, the pure first person, uh, which is no different than the uh, uh, contents of the mind, except that you have made now a distinction that is uh, crucial. And it gets a little bit more, um, gets a little bit deeper now, but I may have used several times, you know, simple objects to, to exemplify this fact. So this is a, this is a blue pen. Yeah. Now, the pen is both long and it's blue and it's made of plastic. Now, those are three 
attributes of the pen, but the reality of the pen is a single one. The same goes for the content of the mind and the capacity to know that content. In the beginning, those two are all mushed together. And that's where we get identified and we have problem a problem with the content of the mind. Now, when we take the witness in position, we disentangle what's happening in our mind and our witnessing position, meaning our capacity to observe what's happening in the mind. So we make a clear separation between those two. But having made that clear separation, the next step after that, if we really want to create an alchemical change in the content of the mind, is to merge back with it, but to, while completely merge with it, not lose track of the fact that the content and the capacity to know it are two different aspects of that same reality. And it's that separation that makes the entire difference because now we can create the alchemical um, feeling of our emotions whilst remaining uh, as that which transforms them instead of, be uh, instead of confusing ourselves with that which identifies with the emotions. It needs to be done as a first person, but it can only be done as a first person when you have already detached the pure awareness from it. Otherwise, you're totally identified and there's no transformation because you're totally lost trying to get rid of the emotions. So no change can happen in that case. Now, this is the power of the question or rather the instruction. Find out what do you mean by I? It forces you to use your attention in a way that colonizes the deepest parts of your neurology, the most survival based mechanisms. And to get there, you need to, or rather you naturally come and realize that your sense of self is 100% nothing other than a, an intent of departure away from uh, realities of the body that uh, could not be tolerated uh, very early in life. So uh, this is in essence uh, the, the topic of today, that, that question, who am I being the most profound question? Uh, on a philosophical basis, but mostly the most useful uh, piece of advice that we can uh, take when it comes to doing real philosophy and real um, self-realization or, or, or self-investigation, which therefore leads to self-realization. Um, as I said, this is not a philosophical musing or an exercise. It is an orientation of attention in favor of clarifying the mind. And, uh, and the effects are tremendous, but they also trigger uh, a very, very challenging, uh, exhausting, exasperating, uh, and at times desperate um, uh, situation with our neurology, because we're trying to integrate something that is uh, utterly visceral and, um, and uh, ancient in its, um, in its qualities. So um, I hope that uh, you find that uh, interesting or, or edifying in some kind of way. Uh, and let me know in the comment section what you think about it. As usual, if you think that these talks uh, are helpful, uh, especially helpful for others, then your liking, sharing and subscribing makes them more available out there. And it's also very motivating to me. So thanks for watching. I'll be back with more videos pretty soon. Cheers.